if I want to get slaughtered online for saying that, I might have <laughs> I might have started that way. Right. <laughs> All right, welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off Road Podcast. I'm Big Z. I'm Ian. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> welcome back to the studio. Yeah. And uh, today we're talking with a uh, longtime guest of the podcast, uh, George Hamill from the Dirt Life Podcast. How are you doing, bud? What's up, guys? Thank you very much, Zach and Ian, for both uh, having me on. Whoa. Right, let's do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's, that's quality camera work. We're keeping that. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you guys both for having me on again. I really appreciate it. It's always awesome to talk with you guys. You guys are producing some awesome, awesome podcasts. You as well. Thanks. Yeah, you've been pretty busy on the the race circuit, getting uh, the racers on the show. Um, and recently, you've had some pretty big guests. Who's who's been on the show lately? Um, a few guys actually. Um, Rob McCackering was on for the second time, called the Round Two with Rob. Uh, Actually, it was kind of cool because we got to have uh, Carl Renazetter call in on that show and uh, listen to those guys talk about some racing memories and stuff. Because Carl's recently retired over the last couple of years, and Rob is still out there doing it. It's just so cool. Like, never in my wildest dreams as a UTV racer did I ever think that I would be sitting next to legends like that talking about, you know, race talk or pit talk, man. It was to me, it was an honor to be sitting there listening to their stories. The uh, the thing that I found interesting lately is that I'm seeing a lot lot more like guys that are later in their years racing still, whereas in the old days it was like just the teenagers and the twenty somethings, and nowadays you're starting to see thirties and forty year olds, you know, still still being competitive on the race circuit. Is that what you're noticing? Yeah, not just that, but I think with me, like a common thing is the, the camaraderie, like. So those guys, those two were arch rivals. You know what I mean? It was like uh, Larry Bird and Magic Johnson. Like both those dudes were at each other every game, every race, you know, like, and to hear the admiration that they both had for each other was phenomenal. Like that's one of the things that I'll probably take uh, away with me for all the shows that we did over this past year or even year and a half is the camaraderie, man. Like I couldn't believe neither of them had anything bad to say about each other i'm sure they were kind of probably trying to be politically correct right but they <laughs> they they told each other how good and how competitive each other were at the races like it's i i've never heard that in my whole life you know what i mean it would be like telling uh michael jordan hey you know what i was afraid that you were going to run it in on me and do a layup every time you know like specific things that i was so enamored by George, you keep making them basketball analogies. I'm going to take my shirt off. <laughs> yeah, the interesting thing I think, uh, you know, that's that's a trend in in their industry is just that everybody is so connected now, right? And like back in the old days, everybody was so disconnected and isolated that the people you were racing with were the guys you were racing with for like ten years straight, and you you had time to generate like bitterness and and anger and frustration with the same person that kept cutting you off every single weekend. And I think that's a little different now where people are traveling more, people are more connected, more more social, more visible. Um, and I think the camaraderie has benefited from being more open like that. Yeah, I do too. And I think it's just a general love for the, the things that they do. Those guys respect uh, each other so much because they respect what they do so much. You know, uh, Carl has now retired and he's made a life racing off-road and Rob is still doing it uh, and with every single piece of his heart you know like it's so cool to see that and uh even after i got off the phone with uh with carl uh we text messaged a couple days later and he goes what if we get myself and kurt leduc on uh and i'm thinking like dude these guys are such legends like these guys are held like up to the highest standard in my book because i look up to all these guys right and they just want to shoot the shit and talk about it and to me the only thing i could think about and relate that to is how awesome this sport or this hobby, whatever we want to call it is because everybody loves it so much. I think there's a general and mutual respect for each other. Once you've gotten past the learning curve of racing, once you've gotten past the, the, the ego and, and all that, and you're actually thinking, okay, this is actually a living that I'm trying to accomplish here. That's not just me on the weekend trying to one up somebody. It's not me trying to inflate myself. It's, I want to do this for a living because I'm so passionate about it that I'm going to respect those around me as well. It's not like it's a, it's not just an ego trip on the weekends anymore. It's an, it's actual like 
this is business, this is personal, this is friendships, this is who I'm spending my time with, and that it's not worth wasting your time, you know, chipping away at somebody's shoulder to, to create some sort of angst there. Actually, there is a lot of people that are still angry and mad at life, right? But um, well, maybe Ian can answer this question. Like, when you guys go to events and you guys have that same level of, uh, I guess, because you're in the industry, you're working these jobs and stuff. Does it does that stuff come across the same way with people being so happy? Uh, are you talking about just people being generally stoked to be at these events? Uh, because I mean, if yeah, that's I the mean, question, like, you guys know Al Macbeth well. And- yeah. Um, the general sensation in an event is euphoria, and that seems to be everybody's uh, everybody's experience. Uh, before we even started, I was actually going to ask you whether or not you were going to make it out to a couple events this year, maybe Sand Hollow, Utah. You know, we've got the big one coming up this in about a month down in UTV Takeover in Coos Bay, and uh, I have lost a lot of hair just today trying to get things organized for that event so that it can flow really, really nice for everybody. Uh, he doesn't have much hair left, so we got I, I, I have credit. no hair left. <laughs> um, as a matter of fact, I was looking at 70s wigs before we even went live. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it, uh, the, the event scene... A replica of McDonald's. Exactly, exactly. You know, c- growing up on BMX, growing up on dirt bikes and stuff like that, things were pretty bar-to-bar, bar, pretty co- uh, pretty competitive, you know, and, and you get better going doing that. UTV really changed everything for me because, like, there's really nothing more peaceful to me. It doesn't matter if I'm trying to push push the edge or trying to find a line that might, might sketch me out or something like that. I'm never not happy behind the wheel of my car utv (laughs) unless it's broken (laughs) unless it's broken yeah which which can happen um but yeah in terms of um i i I just i i I live for this man it's so much fun and it's so cool to go out there and and mingle with people that are having just as good a time as you are and you know fortunately we're in a position right now where we get to contribute to their fun we get to uh capture their fun and we get to in some instances lead them out, go out on dune rides and stuff like that. It's just, uh, it, we're, we're in a really, really great spot. And, you know, I, I, I personally, I don't have the Jones to go race or anything like that. You know, maybe that'll change. My, my competitive spirit kind of kicks in with my build. And whether or not I think my build is up uh. to the challenge of certain lines that I want to attack, certain things that I want the car to be able to do. So my car, I was thinking about this the other day, you know, your car really doesn't have a budget. You know the budget. The budget just kind of kicks in based on what you want that car to achieve, and uh, that's kind of where I'm at. I'm just <laughs> I'm enjoying every minute. Yeah, and I think that's the same basic uh, or baseline that these racers have is they just want to go out there, race, have a good time, do all this different stuff. And uh, at the end of the day, when you see how competitive all these guys are, and that they can go drink beers right afterwards, it's like it's still it's phenomenal to me coming from a racing background and having a uh, uh, competitive spirit, I guess we'll call it. Like I wanted to battle those guys and I didn't want to see them after the races, but these guys are showing me a whole different way to be because they do want to see each other and they respect each other so much. I mean, maybe they'll go to the races and one of them takes each other out and then all of a sudden they're pissed off at each other or whatever. But at the end of the day, these guys love the fact that they're all good racers and they respect each other so dang much. Yeah, you made some basketball analogies, and that's kind of, you know, I grew up racing dirt bike, or not really racing dirt bike, but racing BMX a lot, and, and but from a basketball standpoint, I ate, slipped, and breathed basketball, so, like, when we would play certain teams and stuff, I knew certain personnel and how I had to attack it, this, that, and the other. Kind of, who who were those guys when you were coming up, like, on minis, 125s, 250s, and stuff that you had to account for? Um. So the guys that I was mostly racing against that are notable is uh, Ricky Carmichael and Nick Way. Uh, I heard those guys are fast. Sean Hamblin was <laughs> so a kid named Sean Hamblin was uh, like my arch rival because uh, we would always be at the same California races. We hung out with each other, and um, unfortunately, I never made it up to the factory level. But those guys did, and it's really made for me to understand that I was racing against those guys. I even remember at one time. Uh, I got a second or a third at Las Vegas World Mini Grand Prix to Ricky Carmichael. But the fact of the race was he was almost half a lap, three quarters of a lap ahead of all of us. <laughs> yeah. uh, now, remind me, uh, with Sean, how, how old is he now? Is he, is he kind of in his mid-late 30s? He, yeah, yeah. So he's, I think, 
two or three years younger than me. So yeah, so he's probably not forty yet. But yeah, he's uh he's still one badass dude, man. Dude, I think I I, I know who you're talking about. There's actually a Coos Bay clip where Sean's featured on there, and that dude's got some style, man. Like he can lay that thing over if I yeah. remember right. Dude, yeah, he's a he's a bad mofo on a dirt bike. I think he got a factory Suzuki ride, maybe. But he yeah. was a uh, he was fast, man. He just yeah, there's, the there's a handful of fast guys up here in the Pacific Northwest too. You know, Villapoto's from up here. Josh Hill has roots up here. Uh, Josh was kind of my like. Josh was the guy I was always pulling for because he's kind of the underdog, and it just seemed like he was, you know, very very talented, very quick dude, but also just freaking fearless. Dude, fearless is the key when I hear him. Like, did you see he made a couple mains this year too? Isn't he like ninety years old? He basically. <laughs> Dude, he is still lightning fast. I, he is. I think he was top 15 at a couple Supercrosses this year. Wow. No, that's awesome. Yeah. Like, I mean, qualifying for a main event these days is a freaking huge accomplishment. Yeah. Yeah. One of the last races I think I saw him race, uh, win actually was a, was a mud race. I can't remember if it was like one of the Anaheim races, but, uh, you know, if you throw mud in the mix, all bets are off, you know, guys, you know, I always loved watching mud, mud races because growing up, one of my fav- favorite guys was Kevin Wyndham and Kevin, you know, yep. Kevin, when you threw in conditions, you know, Kevin was kind of the favorite. So it was always kind of fun to watch. Which one was that? Didn't, uh, him and Reed duel it out at like a Daytona mud race or something like that? I can't remember. Wyndham's Wyndham's wins in the, in the 450 class. I could, they they were kind of few and far between, but they were fun to watch when it happened. That's for sure. Dude, he's still like. Matt, we asked this question the other day. Mount Rushmore of uh, of dirt bike racing. Uh, Damon Bradshaw was like my number one. Uh, Kevin Wyndham was up there. Um, James Stewart, not because he won so many races, but because he just was so flashy and kind of changed the game. And uh, who did I pick as my third one? Um, I've always liked David Bailey just because his uh, his story. But man, there's so many dudes that you could put on Mount Rushmore of motocross. What would yours be? Uh, well, my son's named after Jeremy McGrath, so there's uh, he goes into the list. Obviously, that's a given. Yeah, that, that's a given. Uh, Wyndham's up there. I just loved Wyndham's style, man. I I really really liked watching him ride. Uh, Yogi's up there. Uh, I would probably put. Uh, oh, Yogi came up. Yep. Yeah, like Carmichael. Carmichael is like, I love to be blown away. Like, I love to watch something just be, just shake your head where you're just like, what are you going to do? You know, Carmichael was that guy. Like, he was, Carmichael and Stewart were that guy. You know, you, guys that could wreck on the first lap and still win. I mean, that's dumb. Like, those guys don't exist anymore. <laughs> Dude, I, I saw a clip that reminded me that Carmichael lapped the whole field at uh, an outdoor national. The whole, I think it was Washoe. Second or, place, lap second place. I think it was Washougal, wasn't it? Dude, I don't even remember. It was like it was in the mud, but like that doesn't happen. Like that's no. like one person making all the points in a basketball game. If we're using basketball references, right? No, I, I, I would put those guys on that list. You know, one guy that I really, really was looking forward to seeing kind of mature was Ernesto Fonseca. And, uh, you know, because even uh, McGrath kind of dubbed him as the second coming. And uh, Ernesto was really fun to watch. That was kind of an unfortunate situation for sure. Good dude, too. So recently you've been having uh, a number of younger racers on the show. And um, going back to a little bit about that um, camaraderie and, and sportsmanship thing, I've noticed that a lot of those racers are starting to have this like this personality of like just being chill with everything and then, you know, throwing down on the race course. Like I've been seeing a lot of that in these younger racers, like especially these young uh, female athletes. You know, you, you have them on the show or you, you see them out and about at, at trade shows or whatever. And they're just they're kind of hanging out, shooting the breeze, talking like just someone's daughter or you know a young woman or whatever just like a normal attendee to the show and and all of a sudden they're throwing down you know record lap times on the on the race course um where back in my day when i was talking to you know younger racers that were my age it was all like bravado and all like showmanship and like just i'm better i'm bigger i'm tougher i'm acting 20 years older than i really am and uh and i think that recently i've noticed that there's a little bit more freedom to be yourself in this industry. And I think that's something I've noticed with some of those young people that you've been interviewing lately. They can just be themselves. They can be young. There's nothing wrong with them being who they are um, and still throwing down on the race course on the weekend. Yeah, I can definitely agree with that. Um, 
before I answer that question, let me ask you this. How much has social media changed uh, your life and then adversely your children's lives? Because I think that's where my answer will come from. Yeah, I know there's there's a lot of discussion around that, right? And um, I have two young boys. I have one that just turned 14 uh, last week, and I have another 11-year-old. Um, and I've, I've taken a stance of basically protecting them from, <laughs> from the world until they're mature enough to, to accept that responsibility because it can be, you know, with a young man and, and the options that are given to you in this world, kind of a burden to, to, to keep things together. And, uh, and so as a parent, I have, I've taken the approach of just managing, uh, the balance between maturity and responsibility um, so they're, they're really kind of, um, shielded from a lot of what's going on. But if I know a few friends that have more mature kids that are more, um, on a different playing level than, you know, some other kids and, and they're on social media, just dominating, like they're not even like YouTube stars or anything like that, but they're just, they're, they're so mature in their way they approach it. Cause they completely understand it. Like they completely from the ground up live, eat and breathe it and understand exactly what's happening with every interaction. And, um, I think that is is something that differentiates different people with on with their online experience and, and with racers, they're thrown into it. They're thrown into having to understand sponsors and tagging and brand representation and keeping face and all these different things, right? So, um, you know, there's a different level of maturity that goes into just trusting a young child w- or a young person um, with a race car or a race bike or, or whatever where they can possibly put their life on the line. Um, and I think the, those those young people that you can trust with that um, are you typically also able to be trusted with a social presence and and a, and a certain guidance towards that. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, I, I think the way that I would answer your initial question is that these young kids, they see so much stuff that we never saw without social media when we were growing up because we're the old guys now. Right. Uh, but like they they see everything whether it's good, bad, indifferent, everything, they see everything. So their perception is a little bit different when it comes to being uh, in the limelight, I guess you could say. Um, So they can go out there and race. And um, I was actually talking to one of the young racers, his name is Caden Danbury, about this the other day. Um, He was really hard on himself at a race because he made a mistake during the race. And I told him, One of the best things about any racer champion or otherwise is that racers have the ability to forget what happened in a millisecond so they can just move on. And he said, yeah, I don't do that, but I'm going to from now on. And I think a lot of the kids that um, excel is because they don't dwell on anything. It's just like scrolling through your feed on social media. In two seconds, you forget what was you just scrolled by. Oh, where did I go? What did I do? I mean, like I got stuck in this YouTube wormhole that I was looking for a way to fix a tire. And all of a sudden I'm watching this film of Jeremy McGrath flying through the air. You know, like if you forget so easily. And so I think that's where most of it comes from. Guys like me, I, I, don't, I still don't really understand the social media the way that the kids do. I do think- can understand what it's good for it. Go ahead, Ian. Yeah, do you think that that actually breeds a little bit of a lack of competitiveness? Because you're talking about not dwelling. Do you think Ricky Carmichael dwelled? If he dumped the bike and didn't place and, and didn't place first, it probably chewed on him until he was on the next starting line. Yeah, I don't. I don't mean it at that long level. I mean it as a short level. Like you forget that you missed that rut in the last corner because you want to do it better next time. Um, a good racer never forgets their flaws, right? But I'm more meaning that you forget quickly so that you don't dwell on something that affects your results. So like Ricky Carmichael was was a top dog. I mean, he wouldn't remember that he swapped out and was doing a tank slapper all the way down a straightaway before he went up to LaRocco's lead. He would have just did it and just never let off. Right. And totally forgot that he did that on the next lap. But if he had wrecked, he would make sure that he didn't wreck so he could win the next photo. So I think you got to have both, but my, uh, my, my understanding of it when I talk to these kids is that a lot of it comes from them just being in a race car from being so young. It's it just plain and simple. They, 
they've done it ever since they were little. There's a there's definitely a a, a kind of an, a hidden skill set that comes with just the responsibility of sitting in the driver's seat. I think um, you know you can. Like I, I've put my son behind the steering wheel a few times just to see where he was at mentally with the ability to to absorb all that stimulation, right? Like all the all the different surrounding things that are going on and, and what the car is doing and what the people in the passenger seat are doing and all those different things that happen. Um, and I think that the exposure of that uh, responsibility of, of absorbing all those um, sensory overloads, right? Like it conditions you to be able to respond faster and more accurately and not have to panic and to freeze or to hesitate. And uh, I think that is with, with the, how our industry has changed to be more, um, I don't want to say cheap, but more affordable for a family to jump into a racing outfit. Um, you know, we're seeing these younger people show up at younger and younger ages. Like I've had Wyatt Hastings on the other day, um, like other day, a few weeks ago. Uh, and he started racing when he was three, like literally on a dirt bike at three racing. And, you know, and it shows That's, like you put yeah. him on a UTV, you can see him and how his skill set and how his reaction times are different than a competitor his same age. Yeah. And he talks about kind of a surgical approach that I think is way beyond his years, too, you know, in terms of kind of uh, dissecting a track. You know, the thing that kind of con- uh, has me curious is. Where is kind of those, those, I'm not going to say like alpha dogs. I think that's kind of cliche and stuff, but I mean, there's legendary stories of guys like John Elway selling their pool table because a teammate beat them, you know, <laughs> like, uh, Michael, Michael Jordan, not talking to a teammate because he lost a hand of cards or a ping pong game to that teammate, you know, like, I'm wondering if those kids have that chip, that, that chippiness, that, uh, you know, just that, just absolutely almost unhealthy competitiveness you know we can call it unhealthy and we can judge it and we can kind of look at it but but at the fact of the matter is some of those pinnacle athletes it that that's that mentality breeds champions yeah uh, i haven't seen that yet and i don't mean it uh in a bad way for me neither do i yeah for sure maybe they're too young yeah they might be too young to to understand it yet but um i think we will see it from some of these kids because i mean like this is I don't want to call it the first generation, but this is almost the first generation that we're going to see these kids come out. Like they're the pioneers, not us. Like we just kind of jumped into it because we can afford it, you know, but these kids are the the first serious uh, generation that's going to come through. UTVs didn't exist that long ago. You know, when you start talking about like having that, that competitiveness, I think what the difference is that I've seen is that it's more about, they're competitive with themselves, and the other person that was involved with that is just part of that story. It's not on them. Like they're not, I'm not racing Ian and saying, you know, it's Ian's fault that I didn't do that. Or it's because of Ian, I didn't win that or whatever. It's, I didn't perform to up to snuff because Ian edged me out. It's not because of Ian. It's just, he was part of the story. And I think these kids are absorbing that storyline that's way where they're saying like, like why was saying, he's just, it doesn't matter what it is. I'm just, I'm out to win and, and I'm going to win everything. And if I don't win, I'm going to figure out why I didn't win. And, and then the next race is a completely new slate with a new trajectory and a new plan yeah. and a new, and a new experience. That's a good point. Um, I guess if we're talking to Ian, if we were talking like uh, generational things that like we both mentioned, Kevin Windham and things like that, like um, from what I know now being behind the scenes in the industry, instead of being a racer guy, um, social media, and, and again, I don't mean this in a bad way. Social media is way more important than the race win. Social media is more important than going out and practicing in your car. Social media is more important than uh, being at the races, in fact. You know, like it's all generally focused on that. These kids get it. They're way better at social media than any of us are, right? And so they understand that. And when they are able to put themselves in, uh, in their own shoes, be with their friends, be on social media, and just living their lives just like kids and showing this, I think that's what... Uh, gives us the look that what Zach initially started talking about, it gives us the understanding that they're just out here having a good time. 
Like, because so, they're really being kids. They're just filming. You put on social. Yeah, so kind of in a blanket question, like, where where does social media lie for you in, in, in the layer of importance? And, you know, no wrong answer or anything like that. I kind of have, I'll, I'll kind of give you my take on it. I'm, I'm starting to get a little disenfranchised with it. And, the, and I think the show is part of the reason why. Because right now we're speaking to our target audience. People are going to click onto the show because they want to hear what we have to say. You know, the, 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 the show is gaining, it's gaining traction, it's gaining momentum, it's ga- gaining an audience. You never know who's going inter- to interact with your Instagram post. You're at the mercy of that Instagram algorithm. You have no control over it. A lot of it is a crapshoot. So it's very easy to get a little disenfranchised with it. So a lot of the stuff that I've been posting lately is just stuff, stuff that I'm happy with. So I'm not trying to put an agenda. I'm not trying to put an agenda behind it. I'm not trying to put expectations behind it, because, you know, having that creative outlet, which this is kind of a creative outlet, this is much more rewarding because people are clicking and engaging with the show based on the fact that they want to hear people talk about racing. They want to hear people talk about events. They want to hear people talk about the machines that they're out there driving. So this is infinitely much more rewarding than social media. I still understand that social media is very, very important, but you know, hopefully the future goes a little bit more tech free. <laughs> you know, I think it'd be a lot more rewarding for everybody if they just kind of unplugged every now and then and then enjoyed their time behind the wheel. Uh, dude, I couldn't agree more. I mean, everything that you said in that statement was a hundred percent true in my mind. Like I've mentioned it, I think even to Zach before is if social media didn't exist, I would be in heaven. Like I don't want to do social media. We have to do it because of all of, all of us have our jobs and we're trying to produce content for people and we love doing it just like Ian, you just said, but the way that you enjoy the podcast will be like talking about this stuff. Kids like listening to these. I know a bunch of kids that listen to the show every single week uh, for your guys show, whenever you guys produce it for the dirt life show, for other podcasts, dirt bikes, whatever it is. Um, but they don't think of social media the same way. So me ranking importance of social media, it takes the whole podium. It takes first spot, second spot, third spot, fourth spot. Cause it takes 110% of my value in social media, because I understand how much more important it is now than winning a race. You got to remember if you're a kid and you have, let's just say 5,000 followers and you're a racer, that's considered somewhat average now. And that average is still more than you would get if you went and sat in the bleachers at a short course race, if you went to a desert race. So there's zero value in actually going out and winning the race, unless winning the race means you got posted on social media. Right. So it's like, it, it really, it really all goes back to it. And these kids are so focused on it. That it's so natural to them that they're going out and they're doing all these things and filming all these things. It's gratifying because every single one of them has a million of their friends that are doing the same thing. So their interaction and engagement on social is way more than a guy like me, where I answer a few questions for people that are interested in this subject or talking about working on a car or whatever. They're focused. Like that's how they communicate. We didn't learn that way. There's a lot of pressure on those kids too. There's pressures to perform. There's pressure, uh, pressure to, uh, to finish. There's pressure to capture and, and there's pressure to post accurately. And, I, and there's times where I look at that where I wouldn't trade that, you know, I wouldn't trade places with them for the world. Like when Zach and I go out, we have two things. We have a machine and we have a camera. We love to drive and we love cinematics. And when you grab a camera and you nail that shot, it's almost as fun as kill it, hitting a killer line. So everything that brought us to the sand, everything that brought us to the mountain is getting us stoked. You know, I, I just... Uh, you know, it comes back to you have some of those internal dialogues about making sure you're doing it for the right reasons. I know we're doing it for the right reasons. We're out there producing clips, producing content. I mean, it doesn't hurt that we live in one of the most beautiful regions in the entire world. And and we're just out there just, just doing what we love. And I think the, the interesting thing is that, like, if I were to post on social media or if George was to post on social media or, or Ian or whoever – we all have these like strings attached to whether brands or business or whatever. And we have this certain level, this bar that we've set of like, it has to be of certain quality or certain like value or certain accuracy or whatever. And so it causes us to hesitate, right? Like we're, we're not just going to post yeah. a shaky cam out in the sun with a blurry camera type thing. But these young people, 
that's all they know. They're just like, all sure. our friends post this. This is how we post. We just have an emotion. We post it. We have a thought. We post it. We have a uh, something piques our interest. We post it. Like, that's what they do. And so they their bar, I don't want to say is a low bar, but it's it's a different kind of bar. Like, that, their, their purpose for posting is just communication. Like, they're just talking to a friend indirectly versus, you know, directly. And we have a different hesitation. We're saying... Why am I posting this? Okay, how am I going to post this? And, and what's what's the cropping? What's the color balance? Like, we have this weird like hesitation on how we're going to post stuff. And and then this new generation, I think that's why it's easier for them and more natural for them because it's more of just a discussion that happens over the course of twenty five different moments in time, and then they're on to like twenty five other comments right. that happen at twenty five other moments in time. <laughs> that's totally true. Yeah, like. Uh all the happy birthday uh reshares and stories i'm still like i just call my friend and say happy birthday how's your day going like and i forget that social media is the way that all these kids communicate it's 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 pretty phenomenal that the difference that these kids understand and i don't know to go back to what your question was and and kind of how you were asking ian about where does social media rank i think for me like social media for those kids is going to be far more important than anything that they really understand at this point. But the fact is that there, there's a lot of kids that are doing a fantastic job and they're getting recognized for it. You've been interviewing a bunch of people. You moved over to California. So did you like lose the lease on your house or something? You're in a van down by a river or in a Walmart parking lot somewhere. What, what's going yeah. on there? <laughs> I know, right? So I don't know if you guys can see the video, but the, the studio is now a roaming studio sometimes. But uh, yeah, um, moved from Arizona to Southern California uh, just to kind of get the dirt life off the ground and kind of set it up a little bit more. And uh, there was some other personal stuff that I wanted to do in Southern California with my family and things like that. So everything has changed and it's uh, everybody says, why do you move from Arizona to California? But the fact is, is it's better for all of the stuff around me. So I'm really happy with the way that the show is progressing. I'm really happy with the people that I can shake hands and sit down with. It's been phenomenal, the reception that we've gotten uh, from all of the people around. I mean, uh, the show is booked for probably going on four months now. I mean, it's just insane how cool people think it's actually, that actually is. And um, sometimes I got to like, take a step back, you know, like I sit next to some fantastic people. I mean, um, Davy Millsteps was sitting next to me just this past Monday. And I never, ever thought I would ever shake that guy's hand. We we're just talking about normal stuff, man. It's like, it's phenomenal. And, uh, I'm really, really excited that I get to share all these stories with guys like you, because I have so much respect for everything that goes on in the industry now compared to when I was just a racer and focused on my results and my team and keeping things going because there's so much importance on what these people have going. And I love sharing their stories. Yeah. Davey, Davey's just a reminder of how old I am. I remember seeing footage when he was like 12 busting <laughs> off a 200 foot jump and yeah, just nuts. Um, He's a badass for sure. So you've been uh, recently talking with um, some pretty big teams. I mean, you've been uh, over at the Honda racing team uh, shop a number of times and had their leads. You've had the Polaris uh, race manager. You've had a number of different big race teams involved with with the show and, and interviewing them. Um, what are some of the big differences and takeaways that you've gotten from you know, discussing the race life with younger or medium sized teams that have maybe are, are in the middle of um, the upward growth of their career versus these teams that are like, this is like big time business for us where we're solely like focused on investing every dollar, every hour to what we're trying to accomplish as a race team. Well, I think there's two main things. I think I'll start off by just crushing the social media thing is every single person, whether it's the highest level team to the lowest level team, everybody is trying to catch up with social media. Nobody is doing it right and nobody knows how to do it right. And it doesn't matter how well they're doing it. They could be doing it better than me. They could be doing it better than the other teams. In their opinion, they're still not doing it right. So every single person is asking how to do social media right. And I don't think anybody's ever going to find that answer. Um, but the second thing is the most important thing I think in the industry is that all of these people are helping develop the side-by-side -side industry and what's coming down the line next. And it's not just engineers. It's not just winning races. It's literally going out there and you'd be surprised at how many 
people's paths cross between OEMs, manufacturers, uh, parts suppliers, that people never, ever know that these guys, uh, this is not one of them. This is just an example, but Honda working with Polaris or Yamaha working with Honda, like these types of things cross paths all the time. People share information and it all benefits the next level of UTVs for everybody. The example I just gave, again, I'm going to say it very strongly, is not a true example, but it's something that I'm using to relay those stories because those paths cross more than I ever, ever knew before moving to Southern California. In relation to uh, the whole racing element, you know, you go back to like 1998, 97, somewhere in there, there was a big free ride movement. As you know, like yep. what, 98%, 99% of UTV enthusiasts are just that. They're just enthusiasts. Like, I, it's interesting to me, like, where social media fits into this because in those, and in, in around that time period, you had things like Wrathchild, you had things like Terra Firma series, you had Krusty Demon, stuff like that. Now, no, mind Demon, you, yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean, mind you, that that's like, a, a, has a, had a very gnarly feel to it. They were just, they were selling, a, they were selling a lifestyle, but it makes me wonder when that's coming for UTV. And it makes me wonder what platform would it be successful? Would it be on YouTube? Or would it be, would it be, because it's definitely not going to be, it's not going to be gorilla the way that it used to be. You know, you remember back in the day, those DVDs used to, used to circulate underground before they hit mainstream. And it, it feels like, it feels like the industry is kind of trending in that direction. But, you know, the whole gnarly thing, that's been done so many times. <laughs> you know, you can pull up a clip on Instagram right now and find people getting, getting wild on your UTV and stuff. But, it just kind of feels like maybe that the, the, the market's about ready to get kicked in the butt by, by somebody kind of capitalizing on that type of stuff, you know, that are really going out there and doing maybe some aggressive riding mixed with some uh, riding where, you know, it's very, very limited access or real pretty and, you know, it's something very well thought out. Hint, hint, Zach, let's go make a documentary. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, I think there's a definite uh, opportunity there. And, and when I say opportunity, I'm not saying like there's a gold mine. I'm saying there's there's mind share to be had. And and I think part of that is the explosive growth of our industry this last year with everybody's profits, you know, not being super high, but the growth of the, the net growth of everything being so big. Um, it, it I've said it before, as soon as our industry consumes a majority mind share of the general public, where, you know, Joe and Susie down the street have a side by side and then two houses the other way, you know, John and Sally have a side by side and it becomes more common in like rural or urban America. I think that's when that that thing, that group, that person, that whatever is going to explode. And I don't think it's going to be necessarily on any one platform. I don't think it's just going to be YouTube or just TikTok or whatever. I think it's going to be the person that understands that each one of those things has a certain group of people that want to see something. Right. And, they're, and then they're going to understand the tool and be efficient in putting it out. It's not going to be a TV show. It's not going to be, you know, a YouTube reoccurring thing it's not going to be any of these what we would call normal yeah the media system the days of a guy going to a, a, a you know a, a mom and pop uh, store essentially a power sports location and buying a dvd that's a riding clip i think those days are over for sure for sure yeah. and i mean i even with like where i used to work at 509 right like they got their start as a snowmobile film, film company right and the way that they you know grew was they were on the weekends out riding doing crazy stuff filming it editing it, putting it out on DVD, and then going to trade shows and hucking them, right? And that then turned into a product set and then turned into an actual legitimate company. Um, and within the last few years, they've realized we can't spend, you know, $120,000 every year or whatever the on price film. is on, on just filming the same thing over and over again, right? Like there's too many people watching and waiting, and they're going to go somewhere else if they wait too long. And uh, so that's why we're now seeing like they've gotten away from the films and they're going towards, you know, shooting many series content that comes out either every month or every other week or every week or whatever. Um, and that's how companies are, are starting to move. But in the personal side where we're the, the quote unquote underground people that are making content, 
um, you know, it's a it's an everyday, every five seconds thing where you see something, you you want to say something, you you feel something, you you notice something, you, you post it, right? And you just get better and better at doing it, just like this podcast. When we first started, we was we were a little bit awkward, then we got a little more comfortable, and now it's just set it up, go record, done, put it out, right? And I think that's how the mentality and and the next version, the next wave of content is going to be approached. It's just going to be efficient in that the fact that everybody's used to it and knows how to use their tools. Yeah, I agree. Uh, One thing I wanted to say, though, is the content that you guys are providing is freaking sweet. And like, Ian, when you talk about the passion and shooting and going to these locations and stuff, the stuff that you and Zach are doing is phenomenal, man. Like, I really wish I had that uh, level of uh, professionalism in the stuff that we're doing. Uh, what I, more what I wish is that we had time. Guy. Yeah. <laughs> I was I, say, it, yeah. That's all it is, is a time it, suck. Exactly. So. <laughs> I mean, I mean, in, in two months isn't enough. You know, if Zach and I had two months clear, I, I mean, we'd probably be just barely scratching the surface. <laughs> if of what we had we two months do. clear, we'd have so much footage, we would retire on it. Probably. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, he and I have a, we, we have, we, we, cover a lot of similar things very very often like uh, you'll hear zach and i use the word story a lot and that's that's a complicated thing it, it can it can be a complicated thing developing a story you know we did those bdr runs and zach gets blown up on dms for where that content is i get blown up on dms because people see that there's a story there and they want to check it out it's just there's a standard. There's a standard that we want to maintain. There's a standard to the story, and we want to do it a good service. But and like I said, we set a bar, right? Like sure. We have our sure. own bar, and now it's our <laughs> we're our own worst, worst enemy. Well, and and in five days, there's no way we're going to be t- be able to tell the story that that we're hoping for. So it's just trying to figure out kind of a happy medium to get it out there for people to get visibility on it, and then also being happy with it. And that's the biggest struggle I have, right? For sure. It's like. Okay, now I have the content. How do I put it out there without feeling like I'm doing a disservice? We're rushing it. Right? We're rushing it. Right. Yeah. That, you know, uh, one thing Zach told me once, and it stuck with me for a long time, is he and I went out to go do a shoot, and I was up against it, man. Like I was coming off a couple of conference calls, I was coming off uh, some work stuff, and Zach basically said, "Just we, we can't. Just don't force it." He goes, "If you force it, you'll never be happy with it." And I just, I was like, "Yep, yep. Put the camera away." Yep. Like if, if if we're trying to get something achieved in 20 minutes, we'll never be happy with it. We are wasting our time. And just like this podcast, like I'm not prepping the conversation. I'm not saying like we started the podcast that way. We had like show outlines and like topics to hit and, and bullet points to hit. And it's not that's not the way that content comes out well. Right. And the way it comes out authentic is when you just actually create the content authentically. Right. And that's just what we're doing right now, right? We're just talking. Like I didn't I didn't I didn't hit George up and say, Hey, let's talk about the young generation and how they're using social media. Like that was not even on my mind before we went into this conversation. But you know, I think this is how our industry grows and I think this is how people find value is that this is uh finding finding content and, and things that they can consume that that is valuable, topical, timely and all around just more entertainment in in a in a more entertainment centric world well it's meaningful to them as well because they can relate to it so uh, you had uh you've been out like i was saying you've been inter- having a lot of the, you do a, a weekly show i don't think you've mi- have you missed one yet i think you missed maybe one but um you do a show every week right and uh I've been trying to do that as a goal this year is to get to get 50 episodes out. And I think we're, we're still going to do it. But, um, you know, when you're out there, wh- where do you find your balance on uh, putting time into your show versus getting out and actually being outside and riding? Like you just showed us earlier, you know, you got a new battery for your ride. Um, you know, how often are you able to get out and actually be on the dirt? Um, not as often as I'd like to be, but uh yeah, so to go back, uh, we actually have missed a couple shows. At the beginning of the year, I smoked myself on a road bike and uh, broke a whole bunch of bones. And, like, yeah, I'm kind of upset you didn't do that from really the hospital good. bed. I'm really kind of bummed that I didn't get that episode on that you were high on on meds. <laughs> I sent a message to Jesse Nelson, and he's like, "Dude, you're jacked." <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, so I, I uh, technically we did miss a couple episodes, but. Uh, uh, it was well deserved time that I needed to rest. So, uh, but now we're actually doing um, 
I don't want to say two shows a week. We do one live show that's a full production show every Monday night at 5 p.m. And then on Wednesdays or Thursdays, usually it's Thursday at 5.30, we do Instagram live shows. So those are a secondary production for uh, just like what we're talking about, content, uh, getting into different places. So um, we've had so many requests that it's easy because if it's easy to fill because if you don't have enough uh, time, our slots available for the Monday show. You can just put them on Thursday and then when we get time, we can throw them in on the Monday show because it's a little bit longer content. Um, but all of it goes up on uh, every single platform. Even the shitty Instagram audio still goes up on, uh, on iTunes and people can listen to it. So um, the growth of it, like since we're talking about stuff that you guys are good at, the growth of it is I've understood that the numbers increase significantly when you produce that much more content. So that content is easily uh relatable to people more people attach to it more people grow with it the social media grows and the interactions grow so it's uh it's been really beneficial the problem is is like zach you just mentioned is i don't get enough time for me like um i basically just take my bicycle wherever i can go and try to get out when i have a couple hours or something because um the only time i have ridden the side by side since last october was a week and a half ago, I was able to go out for my first time in Southern California with uh, my buddy Steve Westfall, who is the team manager for Rockstar Husky. Yeah, you just got a, um, a new mountain bike. What'd you, what did you pick up? Uh, I picked up uh, basically because I had no other choice. It was, uh, there was inventory of Intense Taser MX. Uh, and I learned that uh, Intense is obviously a bicycle manufacturer, but they uh, are really smart. And Ian will like this one because they manufactured a bicycle that was more motocross related with like red ball fat bars and uh, different motocross products. And they only offer it through parts unlimited, which only offers it to motorcycle dealerships. So these bicycles are only available at motorcycle dealerships, not bicycle dealerships. So there was some inventory left over and I went down and picked up. Yeah. And I went down and picked up one of the uh, entry level ones, (laughs) fucking six grand. Jesus Christ. Right. And uh, so I went and picked up one of the entry level ones and uh, just got that. It looked pretty sweet. I, I, I didn't recognize it. So I was interested to see what it was. I, I love mountain biking and getting out and going, you know, downhill if I can, but it's usually just across the woods or whatever. But, um, but your bike <laughs> really looks, uh, looked interesting to me. So I was interested to see what you had. Dude, I think you would like it. I actually posted a little video of my buddy on uh, social media today. Um, he's my crew chief, but he's a big guy and uh, he loved it because well, like for me, it's the great equalizer because it has a little bit of a motor because it's an e-bike. And uh, now I can torque up some of the hills and I can kind of get back into it. So um, I'm pretty stoked on it, man. I haven't got to use it. I think I've used it five times now. And I'm still like, I feel like I'm an amateur. Like, I feel like I don't know what I'm doing. So I'm really, really excited to keep uh, progressing at it. It's a lot different than the road bike. <laughs> It really is, but dude, the roads are sketchy in Southern California on the road bike, man. <laughs> Cars are hauling ass. Where, uh, where, where are you calling home base these days? Which, which town? Temecula. Oh, cool. Uh, I got to put something on your radar, man. I think um, I, uh, Zach, uh, takeover Utah is third week, third week, fourth week, October. UTV takeover uh, in in Hurricane Utah, San Hollow State Park is October twentieth through the twenty fourth. Bro, you gotta get the van out there, man. <laughs> so. Nice, dude. Yeah, we got free we got free Wi Fi. I can bring some candy, whatever you want. Free home. Oh, we, we really do have free Wi Fi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, you should put that on your radar, man. The the riding out there can be anything from fast to low impact. It's beautiful. It's basically like wheeling out in the Grand Canyon. Uh, I I get. I, I think it's time to get some eyes on these takeover events, buddy. I think you're. I think you're gonna be blown away, man. I really want to. Like I really want to. I was telling Zach, and I I feel like I need to get out there. Um, it's just if the schedule permits. So um, I'll make sure that when that timing comes a little bit closer, uh, I'm supposed to go to Baja 500 uh, in July and then Grandin, I think is in September. Um, so that might fit in depending on uh, where the schedule falls in October. Do you know if there's any other uh, uh, conflicts in racing and stuff? Uh, October falls usually pretty busy. If I remember correctly, isn't something. Uh... I think November is the 1000. So it, it is, might actually yeah. work out, man. And, Bucket list has always been Utah and the Zollinger guys, Solder World guys, like all those guys want me to come up there. So I really, really, really want to go. 
Sand Hollow will never disappoint you. I mean, it's fast taking over as one of our favorite riding destinations, no doubt about it. And this year, you know, they've expanded their parking lot for us. Yeah. Or not for us, but they expanded their parking lot. So, like, Vendor Row is going to be almost twice as big. And uh, I think everybody got their eyes open last year with how the event runs because it was the, f- the first time Sand Hollow really ever had an event like that. Um, and I think this year is just going to be bigger than – I think it's going to be bigger than Oregon. And, and I, I think you're right. And then uh, – combine that with the fact that the promoters of that event really like to roll out the red carpet for people that are producing content and uh i I think it'd be a win-win for you man i think you'd love to come out i think you'd love the riding conditions could be you know a yxz would have no problem out there whatsoever uh like i said it's gorgeous it's a good time oh easy basically telling me that the yxz is going to kill me out there (laughs) i just follow me you'll be fine i i think you uh i think you should come race the short course yeah for sure that'd be a lot of fun for sure yeah there's a race up there oh yeah so <clears throat> so utv takeover has it's, it's a big community event but it's a community event and the idea that it's at a destination location and that everybody can participate in the activities so they have uh, they have sand drags they have sand short course they have a uh, hill fest or i guess rally fest in utah where you're racing up the up the rock mountain and down the rock mountain um they have treasure hunts they have guided rides up the, all the you know famous features they have uh, rock and roll bingo they have raffles they have vendor row they have um just a ton of different things that you can participate in everything's family friendly they have barrel racing they have you know a whole bunch of different stuff um and then so basically it's a full-on everything for everybody and uh, so they have a short course racing um, and they have uh, sand drags in different classes, um, just kind of an all around. Everybody can do everything awesome. And then at the end of the end of the week, everybody rallies around, um, you know, Huck Fest and uh, sees everybody throw their cars through the air. And uh, and then eventually we see the big man himself, Al, Al Macbeth, do an exposition and uh, send it to the moon and and back. Yeah. And granted, this is just my opinion, George, but like I've never been to a football game. Uh, a college game, uh, an NFL game. I've never been to a rock concert. I've never been to a Supercross race that rivals a takeover event. That's saying something. Really? Oh, yeah. Not even close, man. Dang, man. That's that's super cool. And I've already, before you uh, threw it out there, Ian, I've already wanted to go. I just have never had it in the schedule. And uh, well, some of it's my fault for just being an idiot and not uh, getting hurt. But the, uh, the fact is, I already wanted to go. So if the schedule does permit, um, there's so many boxes that I would check by going up to the Utah and checking it out. So For sure. I'm in if I can. Yeah, I, I want to say, what is it, about a five-hour, maybe six-hour drive from L.A. out to San Hollow? It's basically two hours past Vegas. Uh, yeah, probably. Well, it's half, I drive half like the trip that we would do. You get to fly this year. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> hopefully I'm not driving. I might be driving. Oh, yeah. Look at Zach. He's all bougie to get an uh, airplane. I know, right? Just no big deal flying first class, you know, whatever. Yeah, I wish it was first class. <laughs> Actually, I found out a trick that if you if you if you book first class your uh your checked baggage is a, is either free or cheaper and it's actually cheaper to do it that way if you're taking multiple big heavy bags than it is to just check your bags in, in economy. So <laughs> I think next time I might be booking a first class ticket. Yeah. Dude, I like the way you think. Uh, going back to the the races, um, what are some of the races you've been to recently, and and how did those go down? Um, I haven't actually been to that many recently. Um, I went to one of the uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with uh, well the Lucas Short Course series uh, shut its doors, but uh, Gas Great American Short Course uh, Lee Perfect is the one that operated a lot of the Lucas stuff. He took over, and he's uh, uh, got a few partners, and he's able to start that back up for. Uh, uh, I think most importantly, he was able to start it up for the kids. So the uh, the best part is, is that all the kids have somewhere to go. It was really neat to see everybody get back to the track. I think they still have some growing pains, and they, they're going to work through it. Um, but uh, I don't know, man. I can't remember that many that I've been to in the past few months here, but I'm really, really looking forward to headed down to Mexico uh, here in uh, July, I think it is. No, June. Sorry. I don't know if I told you this yet, Ian, but I, so I had this idea, George and George and I are going to, in some sort of short fashion, come together and, uh, put together a, a Pocky one chip challenge, uh, episode, but, um, the, uh, th- that's coming up. But to, before we get to that, um, I had an idea the other night that at takeover, 
I'm going to have the taco vendor make us up a spread of not, of tacos, and I have about six or seven in, incrementally increasing in heat and, and spice hot sauces, and we're going to throw down hot one style with tacos. George, you probably heard the rumors that gingers have no, they have no soul. Well, they have no <laughs> taste buds either. I can't, I can't. Dude, he's going to kill me. <laughs> I can promise you that Zach's going to kill me. I've been like <laughs> dreading this hockey one chip challenge. Like you have, you have no idea, man. One of the last events we went to, he bought some hot jerky. I don't know what it was. And one of my coworkers was picking it up and he's sitting there sweating and crying the whole time and then just keep eating it. I think Zach dove into it a number of times and it just, whatever. Well, I finished like, my bag and then I snacked off his. So yeah. I don't know if he was crying or eating it because he felt like he needed to or <laughs> or if he actually enjoyed it. But uh, yeah, one of the vendors there has has a whole smoked meats variety and and uh, but the taco vendor said they have some secret hot sauce, and so I'm gonna have, I already asked them to bring it, and they're gonna they're gonna bring it. You're kind of rubbing off on me, man, because like the wife started buying salsa. I told him, <laughs> I told her, I was just like, dude, this is rubbish, man. Bring some hot okay, stuff. Okay, if in you're here, bringing man. pineapple mango salsa home, that's not salsa. Hey, that's dessert. Hey, if it's hot for me. It, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of salsa, oh George, God, what's your favorite salsa? I, uh, I don't know. Like, I like this salsa from uh, the, uh, it's called the Carniceria, the meat market down in uh, Old Town Temecula. There's a really good one that they got down there, but it's uh, it's smoking hot. Like, uh, Zach, you would love it. You would think it's probably mild, but I think Ian would probably die. And uh, <laughs> just going beyond that, I'm I'm training like a mother to get this hockey <laughs> one ship challenge down. Even before we just had this, uh, this phone call or this, uh, uh, podcast. I was at a place called BK Tacos. I got a snoring dog with the side of uh, what they call chili autobados. And basically, what it is is these super, super hot, uh, they kind of look like a yellow chili or yellow pepper, but they're like hotter than shit, man. And they're in this lemon sauce. And so I eat, there's like six or seven of them in there. Um, I almost killed the person I was meeting with, uh, but she, uh, <laughs> she tasted it and she liked it. And, uh, I ate four or five of them, and I swear to God, I looked like I walked out of the gym because I was sweating so hard. So I'm training <laughs> like a mother for this bad boy. You, you know, I do appreciate that you said that I would probably die. You can go <laughs> ahead and go all in on that. I, I absolutely would. When when we were headed back from Utah, we had some Chipotle that was hot, and I, I basically, you know, the, the old Terrence and Philip movie, <laughs> Asses of Fire, it was very much, very much in that vein. So it was a rough night. I think... We had uh, on the way to Oregon last time. We had some bacon on a stick, and I think that was too much for you. <laughs> Probably, yeah. Well, uh, the few people that I have seen or are told about this hockey chip challenge, um, they're either all in wanting to do it with us, or they're telling me that I need to start preparing. I'm going to die. I shouldn't do it. That I'm going to be down for a week, and I'm just like, you know what? I just got to get this thing done. Like uh, you're making it way worse. I already think I'm going to die. Now I'm getting scared. <laughs> I'll be your guys' hype, man. I'll be Don King on the sideline or Boondini Brown. <laughs> I can just see, I can just see Ian with the towel. Like, Whoa, let's go. <laughs> yeah. Hey, only if you can stick your hair. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah you can't do that. <laughs> you can get a wig. <laughs> yeah. I, I've actually, I, I, I posted the other day. I got like six or seven bottles of of hot sauce <laughs> coming to me. Nice. So so it's no it's no slow train over here. I've been all in, and the other day I had some ghost pepper chips, and then I had some. Uh, this is it? this is all the influence of first we feast. <laughs> I love some, that show. Yeah. <laughs> Who doesn't? So it'll hey, be a so good what time. What have you guys been up to lately, man? Other than preparing for this pocket challenge, have you guys been uh, doing a lot of stuff? Because honestly, man, I'm really like. There was a couple times I wanted to call you, Zach. Um, well, I needed to call Ian for a freaking battery, but uh, <laughs> my dumbass just got a stock one from the uh, uh, and paid way too much for it. Um, but I should have called Ian and got that. But I wanted to understand like all the content that you're doing because honestly, man, I need some help. Um, yeah, I mean, we both got two different tracks we're kind of on. Um, I've been completely consumed with TakeOver. George, uh, this, them. this is the first time Zach and I have seen each other in probably two and a half weeks. <laughs> it's been I, a while. It's probably every bit of that. Yeah, I, I had a really, really bad stomach virus there, and uh, it took a little while for me to knock it out. Oh, no. Um, 
Yeah, but uh, I'm I'm back on the men, but uh, basically just getting prepped for the show season, which is about to just go completely mental. You know, we've got the RZR Pro coming back, and that thing looks like a Baja pre-runner. It look, oh, it's so gnarly. It's going to be bitching. Um, so I've got dates lined up to get that thing wrapped. The X3, the X3 is getting some work done on it currently right now just to get it just to get it pretty. It's got a new set of doors coming in, and so we're going to be rolling into hot, rolling in hot to UTV takeover and. Uh, having a lot of fun in that regard but uh yeah it's just kind of scratching a bunch of stuff off the list before the show season goes totally freaking mental yeah and you've been taking over a lot more of the media stuff with full throttle so you guys have been canning a lot of footage to to put out shorts and and things like that right. and uh like in my garage right now i've got seven products to finish filming reviews on um i got an installation video i, I went and bought hardware for yesterday to finish and uh i got a bunch of you know product reviews and long-term reviews and well i gotta give my boy here a little bit of love man like uh the 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 takeover media decks have dropped over the last 24 48 hours and they're freaking beautiful dude like they are literally they look as good oh as dude i saw one of those those things are killer they 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 look as good as any online publication it, yeah, I just he the, my man over here absolutely freaking killed it. I was actually talking to the main promoter at Takeover today, and we were I was just going, yeah, that blew me away. He just killed that, and and he was in total agreement. It looks fantastic. Yeah, you know, really, what it comes down to is uh, <laughs> wanting to represent our industry the best way we can. And I'm passionate about what we do, and I have a bar personally set so high that you know it's not worth my time if i'm not going to try to meet that bar yeah and uh i i, I want to bring change and i want to bring growth to what we do and i think i think we're getting there well and you're doing this thing with the podcast and you're yeah. doing this thing with the vlog that people forget what a photographer you are like i, I was i was t you know my daughter is about to go into her senior year and she sees how many photographers that that i personally work with on the full throttle side of things she goes well who did this and i'll tell her who did it she goes well Will she do some, will he will he do some senior pictures for me? Will she do some senior pictures for me? I'm like, sure, yeah, we can set that up. And and then she doesn't bring up Zach. I'm like, well, why wouldn't you have Zach shoot? Zach's gonna be everywhere we're we're at. Zach shoots photos. I'm like, Zach murders <laughs> photos. <laughs> like Zach kills with a camera. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's gonna be a good time this year. I think once we get the ball rolling on on capturing content and, and then turning it around quick enough, I think it's gonna be kind of a snowball uh by the end of the year, we're going to be so burdened with, with work of stuff to do. It's, it's going to be crazy. Yeah. Way so, to go. Making all of us guys that don't know how to as good as you look like crap. Dude. So, <laughs> so what, what we need to do is just set up a workshop, the off-road media group workshop where we just kind of go through everything do classes and, and work through it. I think that would be cool. <laughs> Off-road media <laughs> workshop, dude. That's that's badass. Throwing a little first aid element into it and stuff oh, yeah. like that. Make it a make it an all encompassing thing. I think we just came up with an idea for a whole new trade show. Dude, let's get it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm patenting that. Anybody watching this online, that's mine. If you take it, I'm suing you. Stop sucking. <laughs> Sponsored by the side by side guys. That's the slogan. <laughs> so, anyways, that's awesome. That's awesome. So what do you got going on? What are you working on? On that same on that same subject, you just actually triggered a a, a memory that we were talking about uh, the other day. Is uh, you know a, a racer named Jared Brooks? Not familiar. Yes, yeah, so Jared Brooks is a Pro Two uh, short course racer, uh, multi time champion actually. But uh, he's doing uh, uh, kind of like a giving back. He's training kids, and uh, man, he had all of that same stuff like basically talking about, you know, you guys are talking about training on the media end of it. Um, his uh, soon to be wife, Aspen Taylor, she um, was out there telling the kids uh, how to do the media stuff, showing them how to talk on TV and uh, basically kind of giving them the same type of information that you were just jokingly saying that you guys could help provide. Like so they were having um, classes or it's cool to see that. Yeah. So they were having like, uh, they have this track day at Temecula and they go to a short course track and teach them how to drive and do all that stuff. They got guys like miles cheek out there and uh, other drivers that are showing them lines. And, I mean, the kids, that's what they love. Right. Uh, but there's so much more to it. You need to know how to do social media. Like we talked about before, you need to know how to speak on camera. You got to do all these other things. And, uh, they had uh, the crew chief, Tanner. He was also out there as well. 
and uh, he was showing the kids, how, or excuse me, the parents, how to talk to the kids, um, what not to do on the radio, how to not get excited, to make sure you're monotone, to tell them uh, lane choices, all kinds of different things. And it was phenomenal for me to see uh, that they were giving back and providing so much information. It was really, really cool. Just, I mean, you guys are jokingly saying it right now, but people are out there actually doing it, man. I, I got to ask you, too, uh, about five minutes ago, you made a comment about some media aspirations and stuff, and you closed it by saying, "We I need help. Uh, that tells me you got some goals that you're going after. What, you want to go into that, or is it is that top secret information? Uh, no, I mean, no, that's top secret of me. We could all die tomorrow, right? So um, uh, I, I've already started a, a corporation in Southern California called The Media House, and uh, The Media House is one of uh, what I want to do is I want to have... Uh, a facility where we can uh, give the opportunity for somebody like you guys to have a better uh, reach to be able to interview guests for uh, like, let's just say Zach's wife wants to start a podcast on uh, cooking, cooking spicy food for your husband, whatever it is. Uh, Plausible. You can, yeah, <laughs> you can come down to the studio, you can uh, have a place to do it all and they get produced and you just pay a certain fee a month. Um, but there. The main thing that I want to do is I want to give you guys or people that are similar to like you guys. Uh, I moved to Southern California to be able to sit next to the people that I talk to. Well, you guys can now do the same thing because we'll have a studio that they can just come to sit behind a microphone. Zach can do the production of it and just send it out just like they were sitting in your studio. So um, it would be really cool to be able to uh, have Zach's help because uh, he's the tech guy, right? Um, to be able to set something like that up. It's a, uh, I don't want to call it a long-term goal because I want to have it happen pretty quickly, but um, it's something that I think would be very, very valuable for people that are in the uh, content production world, which is every single person on the planet now. Right, right. Yeah, calling Zach the tough, the the tech guy, I don't think he even takes offense to it. Like the, from the first meeting that he and I had, where we had coffee at Starbucks to talk about the show, he was ready to record three days later. <laughs> <laughs> It doesn't take me long to put no. things together. Well, and it doesn't hurt that my my brother has a yeah. full you know product professional audio system set up and and everything else and all my technical knowledge. We can pretty much piece anything together if we need to. Yeah, yeah. And full disclosure, Zach's helped out the Dirt Life Show quite a bit with all his awesome. uh, knowledge and information. So I think it's pretty cool that uh, that we have. Uh, well, I don't want to say it's cool that we have distance between us, but it's cool that we have different places that, that we're working out of because we have different opportunities that can come up. Yeah, as, as far as uh, schedule stuff like that goes, are, are, do, do you have Sandsport, Sandsport Super Show on your radar? Honestly, I don't care about going to those. I want to get out there and ride with you guys. I'd rather go to Utah. That's cool. That's cool. Well, it is in your backyard. It's right there in Costa Mesa. Yeah, I mean, I might go just for like a day or something and just hang out. But I probably like I get so sick and tired of those because I uh, and I'm not saying that they suck or anything like everybody goes to them because they want to see certain things. But when I had to work as a racer and I had to be there at the show, I never, ever, I never, ever once walked a trade show in my yeah. whole life. I've never been able to walk because I've been stuck so many times. So uh, if I ever do, I'm just going to go and walk. But, you know, now working. I wouldn't be able to walk around and enjoy it. So yeah, just, I'd rather uh, do something like go to the. Uh, yeah, just come in incognito, man. I can get you into it. He's got a whole selection of wigs. You, can, you can hide out. Well, I can get you a pass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's that's always a that's always the the consideration, uh, right? When you're creating content, is is do I do I uh, participate with this or do I create with this? And uh, it's definitely a struggle that I know it. It's always a burden on my mind of, of whether I'm going to do something or not. So maybe Ian, what I would do is, uh, um, without sounding like an idiot, I would probably go and show up. Uh, what time do you guys leave? Five o'clock. I'd show up at four thirty, walk around for half an hour, and then go get tacos with you guys. Yeah, you can cover it. You could cover that event in an hour if you're not being just super. You know, I mean, there's some OEs there that are, I mean. Nothing sucks about check, checking out a Tatum or a Funko. That's for sure. <laughs> and all those guys will be there. I'm still yet to see him. I've still yet to see him, man, because I was so busy all the time when I had to go before. So maybe I'm just being a sourpuss. Maybe I just need to expand a little bit. Well, I think it's a lot like um, SEMA, for example. Like if it's, you if you're in the, the industry, sand. if you're in the industry, like the word SEMA is like a curse word. It's a four letter word that you just don't want to hear. But 
at the same time, as an enthusiast, you should at least experience it once. Yeah, the seam has changed so much. You know, it was a very much an oriented towards an antique and a tuner show. It, Off-Road's taken over. 100%. Off-Road has completely taken over that event. So if I, so what you're saying is if I show up with, with the Razor with axles that are duct taped together and painted black, I'll fit right in? Well, yeah. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> Nice. Uh, and yeah, I'm not saying I haven't been to Sand Sports because I've been before, but I've literally never walked around. I've gone to the booth where I was supposed to work. I've worked all day and then I've left. So I like, I don't know. I just have a sour feeling. I, if I go, I need to change my outlook and my attitude and just have a good so, time. With so you here's what you do. So here's your plan. Here's your game plan. I say you go, you leave the phone in the van down by the river next to the fence. And then you just walk all the way across the parking lot <laughs> into the event without any electronics, and you just BS with all the cool people that you know there and enjoy the show. Bring the free hug sign, though. Hmm. I don't know if we want to do that <laughs> after last year. <laughs> what What happened? Oh, I got shut down inside of two hours. It was, yeah, it was a crap show. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah, yeah, I see what you're talking about. I thought you guys meant that you personally had something happen with a hug. <laughs> I was like, oh, great. Well, we won't go into story. what we do when we hug, but... Uh, <laughs> That's just any day. <laughs> so what are you looking forward to? I mean, we've talked a little bit about racing and, and interviews and where you live in now and, and uh, the show's circuit and all that stuff. What what are you looking forward to this year? Um, well, this goes a little deeper with me. Uh, my personality is very goal-oriented, and I like to look far ahead into the future. So um, the most the thing that I'm, biggest thing that I'm looking forward to is um, – growing the dirt life show and i'm not saying because i want to grow it as a business model to make more money um growing because i think that people are enjoying it more i think a lot of people are listening to it and interacting more and just like ian said like this is something that we all enjoy we all love talking shop you know like it's something that's truly a passion for all of us so um growing that is really really appetizing and interesting to me and i can't wait to see what happens in the next 6 12 18 months i think it's going to be phenomenal and uh i'm really excited that i was able to put myself in a position to be around all these fantastic people and uh as we grow um i'm getting more opportunities to be able to go to events and to be able to hang out and um who knows man one of these days i might get back in the car and do some uh um, racing on the low level i think it'd be that's pretty cool. fun that's cool how much of the show takes it you know in terms of uh what percentage of the, your mind is occupied by the show because when you're behind the wheel of a rig and you're getting that window time like how much of that how much how much thought process are you putting into the next show the show after that aspirational goals like how much are you how, how much are you putting how much time are you putting into thinking about the future of the show um I realized yesterday I was, ha I was having a meeting with a guy named Alex Dreiler, um, and we were talking about business structure and, and the real meat of what happens behind the, behind the scenes, right? I realized that I'm not putting enough uh, focus on the business structure and the actual show. I'm putting more of a focus in the people and getting the shows lined up and, and things like that. Um, but I guess a simple answer to your question is it's about a 60 to 80 hour work week and 110% yeah. of my focus goes into it. And it's cool because I see the return. Um, the, the way that I'm able to uh, satisfy my heart and my well being is by every time I have a meeting down by the beach eating tacos, I go burn it off by riding my bicycle right afterwards and then go to I, my next meeting. I need meeting. that outlet, so, man. Uh, I, I'm really glad you have that. I, I, I really I really do need that outlet because there's, there's times you just need to burn it off and, and try and focus on something else. I mean, I, I'm consumed almost all the time. Like, we're developing a new commercial while we're at Coos Bay. We're developing a clip while we're at Coos Bay. I've got lines. I've got dune features that I'm going to specifically be looking for to get certain action out of my car. Are, you know it's one of those things where you, your mind just never shuts up man and it, it can get it can get a little frustrating i can i kind of feel like that's a recipe for success and a recipe for failure i think less failure obviously um successful people that's the way their mind thinks so kudos to you but um you definitely need that outlet because otherwise you're gonna crash one of these times for sure yeah i'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the grindstone payoff at the end of the year uh, you know last year was this weird this weird thing for everything, but, but just especially with what 
what I was trying to do and everything getting canceled and everything just getting flipped on its head. Um, and then this year being completely consumed with just a li- like two, th- two or three things. Um, it's been a, a learning curve, but also I know that what I'm investing in is one, I'm passionate about it Two, I know it's rewarding to other people. And three, I know at the end of the year or at the season, whatever this is, um, you know, it's going to turn into something more awesome for everybody yeah. involved. Yeah, I do. Zach and I have been to a lot of rides, a lot of events where we've had, where we've had to cut, cut it short a little bit. Uh, come <laughs> Almost home, everyone. <laughs> yeah, come home a little early. And in 2021, is once the event season starts up, that's something I'm really looking to just nip in the butt. You know, I, I, I'm, I've got my family pretty much conditioned to the fact that, we're going to be out as long as it takes to get what we want. And well, I mean, even at like or in uh, in uh, Utah last year at yep. Takeover, you were packing up the trailer during Huckfest. Mm-hmm. You know, you didn't even get a, you didn't even get to see it. Right. And right. I think that's important. Just even as just the memories that you take away from something is to complete it. Don't right. leave something open and open ended on the end when you come home that you're you're wishing that you finished that thing. Sure. Like, like even if you have to reduce the number of things to make that happen, it's worth it. Right. Anyway, yeah, you guys are doing such a great job, but man, don't, don't lose that drive because you guys are kicking ass. Well, I'm looking forward to uh, getting out and getting behind the camera some more and, and getting some content and not just all this prep work that I've been doing for the last three months. Um, and uh, I look forward to, you know, hopefully having an opportunity to run into you and, and some of your buddies and and uh, and all the buddies I met last year at all these events. Uh, I can't look. I can't wait to, to get back with those guys and and having a, a even bigger party. So oh, yeah, I hear you, man. Like uh, I, I told you a couple goals that we had for takeover. I would love nothing more than to kill about a six hour afternoon and then make UTV's version of the Beastie Boys video sabotage on, <laughs> on, on, on UTV. I think it'd be freaking bitching. So I, what I heard was Ian just say he wanted to be a YouTuber. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. <laughs> so so anyways, thanks for jumping on the show today. I know it, it was only a day or two ago that I asked you if you wanted to be on. So thanks for doing it out of your van and hopefully um uh you don't got too many cops outside your door waiting for you to move um <laughs> the the uh the seeing the, the mystery white van out in the parking lot um but uh yeah so thanks for coming on the show and uh for everybody else out in uh, on the interwebs peace peace <laughs>